Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another episode of the show and uh, the third of the restaurant wine series. Uh, we have got the J. Lore 2008 Paso Robles Merlot Los Osos. I think Osos is like bear or something like that. No, I can't remember what it is. I should have looked at it before I started thinking about what it was. Um, anyway, so this is a 2008 Merlot and uh, this can be had from Specs for ten dollars nineteen cents uh, in a restaurant. It will range anywhere from thirty-five to forty-five dollars a bottle, and uh, the restaurant will pay between nine and ten dollars for it. So again, very close to what um, very close to what the. Uh, the average person is going to be spending on a bottle. So uh, Jay Lord. Now this is one of those uh, this is one of those wines that I've or wineries I've wanted to try some something from a Walt from a long time, and um, so I'm pretty excited about trying it out. Uh, they've been around for a while. Um, it said that uh, in the '60s, J Jay says for Jerry um, that uh, he bought. Uh, 1972, he, he planted his original 280 acres of varietal grapes. So, in the 60s, he was looking at uh, uh, growing some grapes. He finally got, finally, I guess, bought some property, got it all set up uh, in the Central Coast. Now, this is one of those things where back then, um, all California wine was really starting to kind of come up, but the focus was more on Napa Valley and Sonoma, and uh, Central Coast was like nobody cared about. Um, so he decided that this would be a great spot to, to grow grapes and to make wine from it. So um, the Paso Robles AVA is kind of almost almost literally right in the middle between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, Central Coast is this kind of all-encompassing uh, region of, of California that's between San Francisco and Los Angeles um, along the coast. So um, uh, this particular Merlot is 81% Merlot, 9% Petit Syrah, 7% Malbec, and 2% Syrah. Again, I love fact sheets. Whether I can print them or not, I like to have just information on your website. Please, if you've got someone who can do this, I mean, it doesn't have to look all fancy schmancy, but at least just give me the facts. I'm a geek. Hence the 1337. I want to know these things. A few other things about this uh, when I was reading over this little thing. First of all, um, hey, they give you the harvest dates. Something that not everybody does. Another geeky type of thing. From September 9th through October 3rd of 2008. So um, just realize, you know, they don't harvest everything in one day. They'll harvest things. And they talked about how they harvest things from um, different parts. No, was this this one or was it the other one? Eh. Well, anyway, um, no, they, 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 they harvest at different ranges of ripeness. That's what I was, um, and that's why it's over like basically a month period of time. Um, that, that allows them to combine the grapes and, and create a certain type of blend to it as far as um, a flavor profile. But the other thing that I found pretty um, interesting, besides it's, well, it's aged 12 months in barrel, is that it's using American oak and Hungarian oak. So not your typical, we use American and French, or we use French or we use American. And they tell you where the oak came from, Missouri and Minnesota. Now I'm not as much up on oak as I probably should be, um, other than I have the basic ideas what American, I mean I, have, I know basically what American oak will do and what French oak will do to a wine and how, you know, the types of flavors and aromas it's gonna impart on the wine. I honestly really don't know what Hungarian oak does to wine and why you would use it over something else. Um, just like there's uh, in the northern eastern northeastern part of Italy, 
uh, using Slovenian oak, um, Slovakian oak, uh, Slovenian oak. Um, that's been a tradition in Italy in, in general, but up in that part of Italy, because they're right next to Slovenia, using that type of oak. I honestly don't know what that does other than, oh, Slovenian oak. I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean? Just like, you know, when they, they tout French and American oak, well, they, they think the average American is going to know what that means. They don't. They just know it has oak in it. Anyway, um, the only thing I don't really ever see very much is when people talk about they use this type of oak and they use more than one kind is saying how much the percentage of American is versus another one. They will sometimes put a, um, a little bit, a few more wines down the road. They'll say, 25% or 40% is French oak, or I'm sorry, not, not the type of oak, new oak. Okay, that's great, but how much of it was American oak and how much of that was new, how much it was French and how much was new, and the old oak, how old it is. Again, geeky stuff. Give me the rest of the information. Does it really matter to the average person? No, it doesn't. But for me, it does. Anyway, still, American and Hungarian oak. That's kind of cool. I don't know if I've had any I probably have had some wine that was made aged in Hungarian oak. Some of the Eastern European wines I've had. But um, that was the other thing I found pretty interesting. So let's get on with doing it. Did I start the timer? I bet you I didn't. Oh, I did. We're almost at seven minutes. Good Lord. All right, so um, let's get to tasting and smelling. Oh, kind of nice. A little candy-fied, but you know, definitely some uh, definitely some fruit coming through with this. I'm getting the raspberries. They said it was cherry, didn't they? Cherries? Well, you know, sure. I'll go with cherries too. Yeah, I get that. A little bit of earthiness, but really just a hint. Let's see how it tastes. Again, comparing the other two wines, a little bit, it's a little bit more mouthfeel. Okay, again, lighter body to full bodied. Okay, a little bit more. I'm enjoying this wine a little bit more. You start to see the trend. I tend to like full bodied wines a little more. But here's the other thing a little bit of cream. Get a little bit of that creaminess. Um, and now I'm getting that kind of cherry pie, um, straw, not really strawberry, that kind of a cherry pie feel to it, but not a lot. This is definitely a fruit forward wine. It's fruity. If you like that, then I suggest to have it, to get it. The tannins, about the same as the Coppola, uh, maybe a little bit lighter tannins. Again, tannins don't necessarily, you know, they, they, they're part of the mouth feel, but how does it? How does the, the wine feel? Um, but it's a creamier wine. This is totally a wine I can just drink on its own. I don't need food with it. It will pair well with food. Um, but see, now this is something where I would do something like I would put chicken with this wine barbecue chicken or chicken with like a sauce on it. Um, I would present with that type of chicken. Uh, I could see putting it with, with seafood, like a salmon. Then again, I don't really eat seafood a lot, but just, just my impression of, of salmon and, and how and, and kind of, it can be meaty, I could, you could pair it with that and get away with it. Um, certain sauces you get away with it. Um, it would work well. I would suggest it. So um, I'm saying 88. It's an 88 point wine. Uh, I really like it. I, I, again, it's I like it a little bit better than the other two. But guess what? You know what? This is 1019 of specs. This was less. The Coppola was more. It was right in the middle. So again, price doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It was in the middle of the other two, but I like it a little bit better. It fits my palate. 
All right. Even though I like the vegetal wines a lot, and I don't necessarily go for the creamy wines, it's got nice little. It's it's got a nice little flavor to it. It's awesome. All right, so that's going to do it for today. We're going to uh, push on with the rest of the wines, and we'll see everybody again next time.